to record, but um, so before I jump into my notes, are there any questions, comments, concerns about the reading, about the video, or about the speech as a whole? All right, Beth. No, not at the moment. Go ahead, go ahead, Harmony. I'm listening. Oh, I said no, not at the moment. I don't have any questions right, right. now. Yeah, so we'll, we'll jump in. I'll jump into my notes then. So as you guys know, this notion of Black nationalism takes center stage in this speech. Now, listening to the speech now um, or reading the speech now, um, keeping in mind that this was delivered in 1964, this idea of nationalism in our contemporary moment, in our current day, has more of a problematic, problematic uh, tone or temperature to it. Um, let me ask you guys, when you hear nationalism, what does what images, what thoughts pop into your head when you hear this idea of nationalism? What do you think of? People with strong beliefs. Based centered around what, Nick? That's a very good call out. But centered, what are, what are their beliefs centered around? Around their nation. Right. And typically, right, in our society, when you hear nationalism, it can be conceived as patriotism, right? But also you have things like the, um, the Tiki Torch Cats from a couple of years ago, right? That's a form of nationalism. Um, Trumpism is a form of nationalism, right? So oftentimes in our modern day world, nationalism has a, a negative connotation to it. Would you guys disagree or agree? Disagree or agree? Yes, no, kind of, maybe. Can you repeat that? I said that in our modern world, in today's society, when you hear nationalism, it typically has a negative connotation. Would you agree or disagree? Uh, I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, we agree. All right. So when you hear Malcolm talking about nationalism, Malcolm talking about a Black nationalism, what was your response to that? Did you perceive it as something that would be negative as we have been, um, been kind of socialized to understand nationalism as having a negative connotation? Or do you see the point that Malcolm was trying to get the audience to understand with his notions of, uh, of nationalism? Because I think there's a distinction between what Malcolm is doing with this notion of nationalism and what we have been taught to understand nationalism as, right? And um, this, this idea of putting aside religious differences, right? He says, I'm a Muslim, but I'm gonna leave that, me being a Muslim at home and I'm gonna focus on my blackness. I'm gonna focus on my identity, right? So this falls in line very much with this idea of Pan-Africanism. So instead of focusing on the things that make us different, i.e. religion, um, i.e. Your, your, or your, your um, excuse me, your men and women, right? Class struggle, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna focus on what makes us similar. And Malcolm says, the biggest thing that can bring us all together, the biggest thing that we can unite under is the fact that we're all black. We're gonna use this notion of blackness to be the cornerstone of our unity, okay? And he says, and for us to be able to accomplish this idea of nationalism from a political sphere, from an economic sphere, from a power-based standpoint, we have to be re-educated, right? We have to re-educate the, um, the minds of Black folks so they can realize that the identity that we should focus on most as a people is our Blackness, right? And he says that this re-education program must also embody an, a re-education around economics, right? Around how we use our money, right? And he talks about how you can spend your money within the black community, but there's no black people that run these stores. So in fact, when you do spend your dollars, they're being taken right back out of your community. Now, I think it's important to understand where Malcolm's coming from with his assessment of the economic power that black folks have. So you know, if you listen carefully to this speech, it's 1964, also if you know Malcolm's history, at this point, he's separated from the nation of Islam, right? He's already returned from his, uh, from his Hajj, from traveling to Mecca. And he's at, is in the process of starting Muslim Mosque Incorporated. So, but while he was in the nation of Islam, right? The nation of Islam was based in Chicago. 
the south side of Chicago. At the height of the Nation of Islam's influence, especially when Malcolm was alive, they ran all of the businesses, the um, so banks, dry cleaners, grocery stores, food shops, all of those type of things. The Nation of Islam ran all of that in Chicago, right? So when Malcolm is developing these ideas around economic black nationalism, he's not just making that shit up, right? He's seen this work out through the works of the Nation of Islam. He knows the money that black folks have, right? Because he sees how the Nation of Islam is really able to raise money within the black community, right? So this is a practical application that Malcolm is talking about. This is not hyperbole. This is not um, just wishing on a star. This is something that he's seen happen, okay? Within his speech, it's also a message of self-help, of this idea of agency. And then he shifts the conversation also to an international question of liberty, right? So I'm not going to just focus on how Black folks within the United States are going to get their freedom. I'm looking at how Black folks throughout the world in Africa, right? How the Asians in Vietnam are getting their liberty, right? So he's starting to turn his attention more global. And he's one of the first people within the civil rights movement that begin to have this global outlook towards um, world, world issues. Um, and as I mentioned, right, he's returning from Africa, right? So not only is his attention to world global struggles, he spent time in these countries, right? He went to Ghana, he went to Nigeria, right? He's been to these places that have overthrown their colonial masters. And he's thinking, well, if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? And what is it that they're doing there that allowed them to overthrow their, their colonial masters that we're not doing here? It's nationalism, right? So that's why he says we have to put this idea of nationalism at the center. He makes a, a, an equation, right? He says, what is second-class citizenship? There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. Second-class citizenship is a modern-day slave, right? Second-class citizenship equals colonization. So he's situating America as a colony within the West and power itself. Um, he's talking about this march on Washington, right? He says they got you marching in between Lincoln and another dead man, George Washington, singing We Shall Overcome, right? So what he's really doing while critiquing the march, he's critiquing this idea or this notion of neoliberalism. Has anybody heard of neoliberalism before? Yes, no, maybe neoliberalism. Um, no. So, have you heard of liberalism? Yes. So, yeah. So, somebody, so who who say yes? I'm sorry, Arcelli. Yeah. <laughs> Could you um kind of state to the class what you know about this word word liberalism? Um, well, from what I believe, liberalism is like, like the right of liberty. Uh -huh. so, you, so it's people who believe in liberty, right? Exactly. So yes. you have, if you think about the political- Is it like theory, kind of respecting um, different opinions? That's one way of thinking about liberalism, Melissa. Um, yeah. So you have like your conservatives, right? So yeah. your Republicans would be considered conservatives, right? You have your radicals. So Antifa would be considered like radicals, right? For the most part, your liberals will be situated within the Democratic Party. And they're the ones who will say all the right things, right? They're the ones who will come out um, like summer of 2020, put on their daishiki and take a knee and show that they're in support of Black Lives Matter, right? But what Malcolm is saying, be careful of these neoliberals. And, and when we say neo, it just means like a new form of liberalism, right? So you have colonialism where European powers will go into Africa and take over the resources. Then you have neo-colonialism where they'll put African people in power, but they're still carrying out the colonial interests of, of Europe. Right. So when you hear neo, it's just like a new version of the same thing. So in this case, this is a new version of the liberals. OK, he says this march on Washington was a neoliberal performance. Right. It's not really about changing the material conditions of black folks within America. It's about putting on a good show. We're going to march. We're going to see and we shall overcome. We're going to do all the things 
that make everyone feel comfortable, but we're not gonna change the situations that causes us to march in the first place, okay? I want you to think back, I, I know it's been a little while, um, but I want you to think back to James Baldwin. And I want you to think back to the reading that we had, The Fire Next Time. And I want you to think about how Baldwin ends the fire next time, right? God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. And remember, I told you all that Baldwin is delivering a prophecy, right? Malcolm is doing the same thing. Malcolm is offering an apocalyptic policy, uh, prophecy. What, is the, what does apocalyptic mean? What is the apocalypse? Anybody know what the apocalypse is? Caesar, say that out loud for me, bro. Oh, uh, the end of the world. The end of the world. So think about, think again about Baldwin. He's talking about Noah, right? No more water, no more uh, rainbow sign. Sorry, gave God, sorry. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. So that little piece is about the end of the world, right? An apocalyptic prophecy. Malcolm is doing the same thing. And he's saying, and it really is it's saying the exact same thing, but he's saying it in a different way, right? We have a, a racial powder keg here within America. And if you don't take care of this racial powder keg in 1964, you will have hell to pay in the future, right? So this is the prophecy that Malcolm is offering. You can either take this ballot or you want to deal with these bullets. So how do you want to address black grievance? Do you want to do what the right thing is? by allowing us to vote our way into humanity and to be treated like humans? Or do you want us to get with some shit and start using the bullet to do so, right? It's your choice. And this is a question that Malcolm is posing through this speech. Also, he shifts his attention to the vote, right? And he says, if we're gonna make this ultimatum of the ballot or the bullet, we, know, we need to know how to use the ballot, right? Because for too long, we've been politically immature, right? For too long, they'll come in and promise us all these things to get our vote. But once we're placed in office, once they're placed in office, they don't do any of the things that they promised, right? And I don't think you guys have to look too far to see the reality of this. I don't know if you were paying attention when they were trying to get Biden in office, right? Biden made all the promises in the world. I'm gonna get rid of student debt, right? I'm gonna hash out X amount, X amount of billions of dollars to address the issues that are plaguing the black community, right? But once he gets in office, that amount that he allocated to the black community, it gets shrunk, it gets less and less, right? He ain't said shit about the student debt, right? So what Malcolm is saying, we must hold these politicians accountable. If you're gonna say you're gonna do A, B, and C to get my vote, um, you need to make sure as a voter that you could help this politician to ensuring that they're going to give you A, B, and C before you cast that vote. I seen a, a video of Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter on, uh, online earlier this week. And she was claim, complaining about how now that Biden has been in office, he has done nothing for the Black community. He's done, so he's done things for all communities except the Black community. And I just thought to myself, yo, when will we wake the fuck up? Like how, how long will we continue to blindly vote Democratic, right? And not hold none of these Democrats accountable for the promises that they make, right? Here we have Martin Luther King's daughter making the same complaints that Malcolm was warning us about when he was alive back in 1964. So when he talks about this political immaturity, this is what he's saying, right? Um, another thing that stood out to me in the speech is he tells the audience, talking about the Dixiecrats, another thing to keep in mind, right? So in our world, we know that the Democratic Party is more of the liberal party. The Republican Party is more of the conservative party. So with that understanding, Democratic Party is gonna pass more legislation that will be more favorable for marginalized groups, okay? just as we know that the Republican Party is gonna pass more legislations that will be more favorable for the upper class 
and typically for white folks, right? So back in this time, it was flipped. So there was a time to where the Republican Party were seen to do more for black folks and the Democratic Party was viewed as the, um, the, the racist group, right? But Malcolm is telling you, yo, don't get that shit confused. They're both two sides of the same coin, right? And this is where he gets this idea or this notion of a Dixiecrat, right? So this Southern Democratic Dixiecrat individual, right? So they're, they're the same, they're no difference. And he tells the audience, you know, I know you don't want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. So to me, this is one of the core principles of Malcolm X. He's going to stand on his truth. And whatever he understands the truth to be in that moment, he's going to live by that and stand by that. Another th one, I, I believe it was Dulce, who said, you know, he said what he had to say without fear, right? He didn't worry about the repercussions of what was being said. That's another pillar of Malcolm X, right? There's no fear in Malcolm. So to me, the guiding, the guiding stars of Malcolm X would be the lack of fear and the commitment to truth. Right, His commitment to truth caused him to walk away from the Nation of Islam because he found out some of the things that they claimed to be about, they weren't actually about, right? So he found that as a contradiction and due to this contradiction, he had to leave that organization to maintain his truth, right? Knowing that him leaving the Nation of Islam could very well cost him his life, he did it anyway because he did not operate within fear, right? So these are the two fundamental core principles to understand one Malcolm X. Um, also, he starts to talk more of collection notion, collective notions of freedom, right? So not just him being free for the sake of, sake of himself being free, right? Or black folks in America just being free. He's thinking about all black folks throughout the world, right? So you see this collective notion of freedom taking place. Um, he's developing this um, this organization called Muslim Mosque Incorporated, right? So this would be his Islamic religious sect. And then he also has the, un the organization of Afro-American unity that would do all the political work, right? So he notices that we cannot bring our religions into conversations about politics because that's divisive. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create two separate organizations. One, a religious organization, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, to a political organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. Now, as I mentioned, Malcolm spent a great deal of time in Africa. So as he's coming up with this idea of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, he has witnessed the OAU, the Organization of African Unity. And he's modeling the Organization of Afro-American Unity under the Organization of African Unity. Now the organization of African unity is made up, made up of all the African heads of states who liberated their country, right? So again, this idea of taking the plight of black folks here in America and viewing it from a global perspective this is something that Malcolm really made popular. Um, this gives him the idea, once he begins to look at this globally, right, that this is not a civil rights struggle that we're dealing with for black folks here in America. It's a this is a question of human rights. So let me ask you, when you hear the term black lives matter, right? What does that mean? What is that speaking to? Somebody tell me, what does black lives matter mean? You, no one knows? Like to ourselves? Yeah, what do you think Black Lives Matter means? Speak on what you um, I just think that Black Lives Matter doesn't have to mean that only their lives matter. just since they need the more voice than the more people. Right. But let's like just break it down in the most simplest form, right? What is it to say that Black life matters? What, 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 is, that, what is that indicating? Everyone's life is important. So, the life of everyone is um important no matter what your color your race your culture everyone it's important so but it, 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 if it was saying that Arcelli, then it would say all lives matter right that's the all lives matter argument right um, <laughs> there well then in that case 
they are using the word black because we don't as well not that I'm included but as a community mm -hmm. we don't well most of the people don't okay. consider the black lives matter yeah. so that's it right there so yeah. right. in that case they are using the word black and as the well as basically the okay. answer you know yeah I don't yeah. know how to explain it, but that's right, the it, important just, thing. You, you said exactly what I was looking for, right? Yes. They're saying that Black lives matter only because we exist in a world, we exist in a society that never values Black life, right? So what I'm trying to do for y'all is draw a distinction between civil rights and human rights, right? Because if Black lives matter was a civil rights issue, it would be about Black folks being able to go to school. It'd be about Black folks being able to um, sit and eat where they want to, right? It would be about Black lives, Black folks being able to live where they want to, right? These are civic issues. These are civil issues. Civic issues are about, civic and civil issues are about how you are able to live your life, right? Schools, banks, jobs, churches, right? Human rights is about just the ability to live. What Black Lives Matter is saying is that we have a human rights issue because this certain group of people are not able to live life, right? And this is what Malcolm is doing. He's saying, yo, we're wasting time by continuing going to the United States and trying to appeal to them to see that our lives matter. History has shown that they don't give a fuck. They haven't done it since we've been here. So why do we continue to go there for their for, for seeking justice from the people who are accusing us, right? So what we need to do is go to the higher level up and take them to the United Nations for human rights violation. And this was Malcolm X's overall project as he came towards the end of his life, right? And you also see a shift in Malcolm in the sense that he's willing to work with anybody who wants to um, organize and advocate for the freedom and advancement of African people, right? He says, I will no longer look at um, integrationists as sellouts, right? For lack of a better, better word, term, but they're an, a, an avenue to the same objective, which is freedom, right? So this is another shift that you see within Malcolm X. And again, he, he ends the speech on a, a notion of Pan-African solidarity, right? He talks about, all the countries in Africa who were able to liberate themselves and how we should be following their footsteps as Africans here in the United States. So I'll um, put my speech on pause there. Uh, we'll transition with the time that we have left to our fish bowls. Um, you all should know, excuse me, uh, where you're at with the fish bowl for the semester. So, as I told you guys last week, so if you went twice, you're done. Um, if you went one time, you have one more to go. And if you have not went, you probably want to start fishbowling. Um, is there anyone who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? I would like to volunteer. Got you, Josh. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I'll start calling at random. If you have volunteer, sorry, if you have went twice, just let me know and, and I'll skip past you. Um, Nick, have you, have you fishbowled already? Yeah, I've gone twice already. Thank you, Nick. Um, Arcieli, have you went twice already on your fishbowl? Yes, I have, Professor. Thank you. Um, Rokoyo, I believe you went twice already. Rokoyo, can you just double check for me if you went twice already? Um, yes, I've gone twice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Caesar, have you gone twice already? Uh, no, I just need one more. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, yeah, I can fishbowl. Okay, cool. Um, Emily, have you went twice already? Yes, I've gone twice. Thank you. Dulce, how about you? Uh, I already went twice. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo, have you went twice already? Ricardo? Uh, Jaime, I believe you went twice also. Have you Have you on your fishbowl? Yeah, we're like 10, 15 times already. Okay, cool. Thank you, man. Um, and Alyssa, have you gone twice already? 
Yeah, I went twice. Sir. Perfect. So we'll just go with um, Joshua and Caesar for the fishbowl today. Uh, whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. Um, I like to start it off. Um, I also didn't have a chance to quickly read the article, but I did want to kind of give my idea that I know that Mal uh, the difference between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King is kind of like uh, Malcolm X did more like violence, right? From what I understood. <laughs> Like in his protest, it was more that by all means necessary. So that's what I kind of um, got from him like throughout that I learned. And I could kind of hear that in his speech because I kind of gave it a quick listen before class. And I could kind of hear like kind of not the anger, but more the motivation to stop being nice. And we need to, you know, do something about it. OK, I'm going to circle back to that, Caesar. Um, Josh, you want to uh, step in? Actually, yeah, um, I, I agree uh, to, with what you said, actually, because I, I remember looking at the transcript when I was reading it, and there was a quote that I had written down, which says, uh, you don't have a revolution in which you love your enemy, and you don't have a revolution in which you are begging the system of exploitation to integrate you into it. Revolutions overturn systems, revolutions destroy systems, and that made me think about what you said comparing uh, MLK and Malcolm X, because I agree that Malcolm X is more of a, I believe that quote kind of like shows the main differences between MLK and Malcolm X, because uh, MLK was more like, like peaceful, as you would say, like loving your enemy, and then Malcolm X was more understanding of, uh, you know, that certain things couldn't be done through peaceful, you know, means. Yeah. So um, I, I do want to complicate a little bit of what Caesar is, um, articulating and Josh kind of echoes. And not to say that you guys are wrong, but I, I do believe what you're learning is deeply rooted in the, um, the symbol of Malcolm X and not actual Malcolm X himself. Because if we really get down to it, in spite of what he said, he's never done any violence, right? In fact, one of the reasons why he left the Nation of Islam is because he felt that they would not allow him to engage in the struggles to advocate for black folks in the way that he wanted to, right? So Malcolm himself, he's never done any violence, never lifted a finger in any violent capacity. But what he did do is he wouldn't shy away from the idea of engaging in violent acts, right? In, in his rhetoric, it's all rhetorical. More importantly, Malcolm X, he studied revolution, right? I, I, as I said, he went to Africa and, and spent time with Kwame Nkrumah. Um, these are real revolutionaries, right? So he knew what's required to really change the, the circumstances, right? And he's right. You have to completely overthrow this system because this was done in 1964. Here in 2021, we're still dealing with the same things. So is it that he's violent or does he have an astute observation of what the circumstances are that dictate our reality in this world, you know? And, and I would also argue, if you pay close attention to the work of Malcolm X and the work of Martin Luther King towards the end of their life, they're, they're, they're vastly more similar than they are separate. And when we get into Malcolm, I'm sorry, Martin Luther King next week, you'll start to see that, right? You'll start to see that a lot of the speech that you will hear from Martin Luther King it's not that um, go town on the mountain that America likes to promote, right? So I bring that up to say that a lot of our understandings of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are based on the symbolic representations of these individuals, not their actual words or their actual work. And that's why the third question in the breakout room is like, what new understandings did you gain about Malcolm X by actually reading Malcolm is important. Right, because a lot of people think they know of Malcolm based off of what they heard of Malcolm, right? But you have to really get into the words of the man to know the man. To me, it's, it's the same with like Tupac, right? Everybody talks about this idea of who Tupac was, but never listened to his music, right? Like if you really wanna know what Tupac was about, listen to his records, right? Listen to his interviews. If you really wanna know what Malcolm X was up to, read that autobiography, listen to the speeches. Watch the speeches. That's the best way to get an understanding, not the um, symbols that America will promote to us. Um, are there 
Any other thoughts? Alyssa, what were your thoughts on the reading? We could talk about the um, video that we watched. We could talk about the fishbowl, anything. Just curious to hear what you guys thought about this, the material for this week. Um, I think that I got a better understanding on the Black um, nationalism than I had before. And um, I think when I read more about it, like it'll click more to me and I'll understand way more. But as of right now, I feel like Like I, I knew what black nationalism was, but I didn't really understand the definition or the depth about it. And as like I do right now. So, so I, I really like that. Okay. Can I ask you, Melissa? I'm sorry, Alyssa, excuse me. Do you view black nationalism as something as problematic? Uh mm, no. Um, what would you say is your ethnic background? Um, um, well, my, my, I think, um, what, uh, like Mexican. Okay. <laughs> so, so would you say within your community, within the Mexican community, do they mm -hmm. exhibit forms of nationalism? Yes. So, and the only reason I bring this up just to the class, right? All ethnic groups exhibit forms of nationalism, right? There's a, a Korea town, am I wrong? Right? So that's a form of nationalism. Right? Yeah. There's a Chinatown. That's a form of nationalism, right? Uh, yeah. East Los Angeles in our in, in California, right, is considered a heavily dense populated indigenous area. That's a form of indigenous nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. Anywhere else outside of what I've named is essentially white folks' areas, right? So that's their form yeah. of nationalism. And what happens is their nationalism is interpreted as patriotism, which is also interpreted as normal, right? So they're able to normalize their nationalism in a way that it does not appear to be threatening, but when in actuality, their type of nationalism causes the most harm than any other group, right? Because again, it wasn't black nationalism out marching and talking about you will not replace us, right? It wasn't indigenous people out there storming the capital, um, in Jan last January, right? These were examples of white nationalism performing its white nationalism, right? So it's a difference. Um, Emily, what were your thoughts on the material covered this week? Um, I really enjoyed it. I feel like a lot of us have kind of forgotten or not forgotten, but we've we've stopped realizing how um, we keep voting for different politics and they don't really do anything for us like they like you said they promise a lot to us but they don't really they don't really um, finish what they said they were going to and it's kind of sad and I realized that that's what he really kind of focused on in this reading and I thought that was really interesting yeah and, and so if I could um, use what you're saying Emily to kind of bring our attention back to the video so I, I did that video uh, literally like the week of election when Biden got inaugurated. And if you think about the questions that were posed in this video, I'm really picking up on Malcolm Sinemans and the fact that I don't believe that Biden was gonna do shit for black folks when he got in office, right? And now what has been a year of him in office and he has not done shit for black folks, right? Um, Trump, that's a whole nother story. Um, and then to take it even further, I would still argue that Obama's black ass didn't do shit for black folks, right? He was a great United States president, but he did nothing for black people in, in particular, right? So this notion of politics and, 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 and political power, what is it really? Um, I'm sorry, Jaime, it's, it's, it's actually not a good, it's not an off topic question, but who you're saying, is it President Biden that you're talking about? President Z? I'm looking at it. You feel me? You feel me? Okay. Um, so I, Jaime asked in the chat, do I think Biden was a good um, choice for president? Fuck no. Um, I, I think he's better than, he was better than Trump, right? But I, I don't believe Biden, even Biden's history as a, I believe a Delaware Senator, very racist. Um, he done very racist things. He was um, a, a supporter of three strike laws. 
He was a supporter of the war on drugs. So a lot of his policy before him even becoming vice president was very anti-Black. And then I, I think what's even more problematic is Kamala Harris punk ass, right? Because what she does is she uses her proximity to Blackness to garner the Black vote, right? So you see her hopping off the plane and she got on Chuck Taylors to try to appeal to Black folks. She's wearing Tim's to appeal to Black folks. She's talking about how she listened to Tupac when she was in college, when Tupac didn't have an album out when she was in college, right? So it's all these things to jockey our vote. And I haven't even heard of, of Kamala Harris since she got in office. She ain't said shit since, right? So I think that this, um, this administration is an epic failure, just like all the other 45 administrations that came before them, right? There, I don't believe in this society, we will get a president that will do for black folks what needs to be done. If I, if I could just answer that question bluntly, right? I just don't, I have no faith in it, which is why I don't vote. Um, Nick, why don't you close us out? What are your thoughts on the material we engaged with this week? I think it's very interesting to see this part of Malcolm because uh, like you said, I always thought that Malcolm was, well, not always thought, but from what I've heard, I thought Malcolm was like an extreme person who did do violent things, but seeing this now, uh, I have a new perspective on him that I didn't have before and I appreciate that. Yeah, go. All right, so let me show you guys what your reading is um, going to be for, and, and actually it's not even a reading, it's a, it's a listening. Um, give me one second, let me get that pulled up. It will be another speech. Um, this one will be Martin Luther King. And this is, I've been to the mountaintop speech. This is his final speech. So you'll get to hear like the very last speech from Martin Luther King. And again, I think with, just like Malcolm, it's not gonna be what you have been socialized to believe about Martin Luther King. All right. So we did Malcolm X, Bow of the Bullet already. So next week it will be this one here. I've been to the mountaintop. It's just the video, there's no reading. So just please um, watch the video. I would say if you had not, if you have not watched the Malcolm X video, watch both of them. Because a lot of next week will be about the, a compare and contrast of style, okay? So please watch both videos if you have not done so. Um, are there any questions about next week? Just to clarify, we are doing journals for you as well, too, right? Yes, these are all these are all she has journals, correct? Good okay. question. And then also next week, um, we'll select our videos for your final group project. Any other questions? No questions, Professor. Okay. Outside of that, y'all have a good rest of your week. Um, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to holler at me via text or email, and I will see you all next Monday. Peace. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.